one of the one of the concepts that that I picked up on was this idea, and I guess these two things are related. Uh, the way you describe mindfulness, and, and and a term that I had never heard before called metacognition. Mm-hmm. If you can maybe dig into those a little bit, and then we'll we'll go further. You bet, you bet. Well, I'll start with the smaller subject, and then we can go in the larger subject. The smaller subject is metacognition. This is one of the most revolutionary concepts. It's a big word, obviously. For me, metacognition is essentially thinking about your thinking. Uh, Now, in learning circles, metacognition also means understanding how you think, the process you go through to learn new things and study and so forth. But for our purposes, uh, metacognition is a understanding that concept and practicing it is an incredible freeing experience so metacognition thinking about your thinking basically means that you are aware and you can choose to be aware in moments notice what's going on up here because what happens oftentimes is some problem comes up you know it's a problem it's about this big and then you're not denying the problem it's about this big but the commentary we wrap around it the what ifs we wrap around it the oh my we wrap around it so we wrap around all these other thoughts and all these other uh emotions instead of the problem being this it has now become this and oh, what like this anxiety is. yeah 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 just that snowball effect so metacognition is developing the skill and the discipline to be aware of what's going on up here and then mindfulness is that's one of the sub sub components of mindfulness but let me tell you whether you're a pastor or just you know just a person understanding metacognition can be a profound the problem is that when you when you recognize what's going on up here you don't like it then you have to take some steps to do with that but that would be kind of my short answer to metacognition now mindfulness is a bigger bigger piece and we can go there you can pose questions about mind uh, metacognition if that'd be the better direction to go but yeah, let's go into mindfulness. But I mean, what you just said kind of brings me to a point um, that w- was explained to me when I asked a, a basic question of a pastor: What's the difference between prayer? <clears throat> excuse me, prayer and meditation. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and you know, we we got into it deep. Uh, I think the Latin is meditari, and 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 the way he explained the difference was, you know, that, that prayer is a, an intentional conversation uh, with God and, and Jesus. And, and, and while meditation is more, um, more kind of what you explained in terms of metacognition, which is, which is, is ruminating over, you know, what are the things motivating you or, or the things preventing you from moving forward or, you know, ancillary things that are influencing you and, and trying to come to a centered uh, understanding of what they are so that you can, you know, prayerfully move forward. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting. In uh, the first of the third centuries, in the early part of the church, um, there were two waves of people that left the cities that went into the wilderness, like around Palestine, Syria, and Egypt. The first wave left because of persecution. They wanted to get away from persecution. They still went to the deserts, the wilderness areas. The second wave, when Constantine made Christianity the official religion, others were concerned that, hey, we're getting too cozy with the state, so others left. So scholars say between the first and the third century, probably 30,000 Christians went into the desert. And what they, and this is where monasteries kind of uh, rose up, what they learned, uh, they they saw the desert as a laboratory to learn to, to love Jesus better. And they realized that they had all, you know, our our minds wander. This is called the default mode. They just do. Our minds wander constantly. But they they discovered and found some of these spiritual disciplines like meditation, like mindfulness, that they practiced in that laboratory. And they wrote these things down. And these these books and things have been translated. And so that's one of the kind of pillars when I explain to somebody about mindfulness. You don't have to be afraid of mindfulness. Now, most of the literature out there is has, has roots in, in Buddhism and New Age and so forth like that. But Christian mindfulness 
has roots not only in Christian history, early Christian history, later Christian history, like Tozier and Moody, St. Augustine, even further back, they either practiced these things or recommended them. So there's a biblical, historical basis. There's a biblical basis as well. In fact, the, the Pali language is the language of Buddhism. But we know the Hebrew language is the language of the Old Testament. If you look in, especially Psalms, you see a lot of these examples, especially David meditating. The Hebrew language predated the Pali language, where the word mindfulness was translated out of by several hundred years. So if anybody understood this early on, it was the Hebrews, which our Old Testament is based on. And then in current, but but it's been going on a long time, we, you know, within Christianity, I guess mostly manifested in, in the Catholics, you know, where they had the monasteries and the monks, you know, and, and, you know, their vow of silence was all intentional about isolation and, and being inside your mind and, and allowing Christ to come in. And, you know, so there's, I, I guess those are some of the parallels. Mm -hmm. and it's important to realize too, that uh, there was like one church until like the year thousand when the, uh, uh, Orthodox Church split off. So the first thousand years is basically the one church. And what happened in the Protestant Reformation, the Catholic Church really veered away from biblical Christianity. For those first several hundred years, there was one church, and these kind of practices were practiced by the church, but they kind of got kind of got lost in the in those later centuries. You I, I, forgive me, uh, in, in one of the books you used a a couple of acronyms, um, and I and I understand that one of them has has changed or evolved. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was beats. Now it's breathe. Yep. And and the other was uh, ripe. Um, could you maybe go into explaining maybe how those relate to mindfulness? And you bet, you bet. Well, ripe is kind of my take on something called lex lexio divina. It's an ancient way of reading scripture. And it basically um, uh, involves the, the, the RIPE is the acronym, stands for read, that read the scriptures, immersing yourself in it, just kind of imagining you're there, that you're seeing the sights, you're smelling the smells, you're hearing directly from, you know, whoever's speaking at that point. You're pr then you're praying it, and then you're executing what the Lord impresses on you. Now they Lectio Divina, four phases, was it Editatio, Oratio, and I may be not pronounced that, Lectio, Editatio, Oratio, and con Contemplatio, and I may be pronouncing those wrong. You did it better than I would, so thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's ripe. It's, it's just a way of reading the scripture um, in a reflective, meditative, ruminative kind of a way. So that's what ripe is. But the acronym I developed uh, in my book, Holy Noticing, which is on mindfulness, biblical mindfulness, um, I use the acronym BREATHE. Now, again, there, there is a reluctance by some Christians on mindfulness, and rightly so, because a lot of stuff out there is New Age and Buddhist-based. But again, it's Christian mindfulness is biblically based. It's based in Christian history, and also the latest science tells us the benefits of it. But BREATHE is another acronym that I really recommend people to try to do. And, and maybe the best place to start, Richard, is let me give you the definition of what Christian mindfulness that I call holy noticing. So here's the, my definition. Holy noticing is the art of living in the present, noticing with a holy purpose, God and his handiwork, our relationships, and our inner world of thoughts and feelings. So it's an art of living in the present, noticing with a holy purpose. It's different from secular mindfulness. A holy purpose, God in his works, our relationships, and our inner world of thoughts and feelings. So that's the definition. You know, it's, it, and, and I think that's really important because both of those, the reason I, I inquired about both of those is, you know, I think, you know, so often we um, don't take the time both, you know, for scripture and, and, and just, you know, interpreting our world to contemplate more than the reaction to a stimuli where, where we, right. we, 
you know, I, I think you even use these terms, the emotional side of the brain and the thinking side of the brain. And, and oftentimes the emotional side, you know, for fear or anxiety, that's, that's our, our go-to reaction oftentimes is, is self-preservation mode, you know, the old flight or fight. And, Mm -hmm. and so, you know, why they registered so well with me, it was, was about, really absorbing, you know, it could be the written word or it could be, you know, other things that, you know, we have to consciously make the effort to, you know, ingrain them in ourselves and think about them and, and relate them before we move forward, you know, before we react, we have to think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what often happens is um, that, we often are just living on, on the uh, react in the reactive mode and the spirit filled life uh, is, as we walk with God and we understand some of these kind of dynamics and so forth. As we walk with God, we learn more and more how to create a space between the feeling and the behavior. There are actually physiological things that go on inside us. The, the fight flight response is not uh, a conscious thing we can control. It starts uh, because of a stimulus in our mind or something outside. It engages the, the amygdala and other parts of the brain and neurotransmitters are released. And so we have this physiological response, but less than a half a second later, we're actually aware of the feeling, like I'm angry, I'm scared, I'm shamed, I'm embarrassed. And then once we become aware of it, there is the space between the awareness and the feel of threat and the response. And what happens is, as we grow in our faith, as we understand these dynamics, whereas that space would have been like this, we would just have reacted. It could have been outside or inside, you know, all the world's, the sky's falling. But we can expand that space as we grow in the Lord so that there's more time for the Holy Spirit to work in this space to direct us to what is the right way we need to respond. And that's what mindfulness does. It expands that space between the feeling of the emotion and the response. 